And let's prepare our hearts. If you would, if you have the ability, would you stand to your feet? I'm going to get down on my knees. Let's go before the Lord together in prayer today. Father, we thank you for your presence in this place. Already today, God, we're just grateful to be in your house, Lord, to experience your goodness. And Father, we just want to hear from you today, God. It's the word that makes all the difference in our lives. The entrance of your word brings light. And so today, God, as we open your word, we pray that you open it up to us. Open the eyes of our understanding. Open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, our hearts to have a good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown. May it produce fruit in each and every one of our individual lives. Today, Lord, we acknowledge it's not a man or a woman, not the young or the old, not the black, the white, the brown, any other color we could imagine. We came to hear from you. We welcome you, Holy Spirit, to be our teacher, be our guide. Give us your vision, your wisdom, your instruction, your direction, even the correction we need for our lives, Lord, where we've gotten off track. God, get us back on track where you want us to be, Lord. We'll give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it. Today, God, we don't just ask this blessing upon ourselves. We'd ask it for all of the churches, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet, that are preaching and hearing the gospel. We would ask, Lord God, that you would bless them as you would bless us. Denominational, non-denominational, doesn't matter, God. Bless the Baptists, Lutherans, Methodists, Episcopalians, Charismatics, Pentecostals, Calvary Chapels, Harvest, God, Oak Valley, Ecclesia and Trinity and Emmanuel Baptist, the way, God. We would bless citizens and sandals, God, all the great churches that are out there, the four square denominations and assemblies of God. We would bless, Lord, set free and victory outreach, God, crossroads, God, all the great churches that are out there, our Catholic brothers and sisters and Adventist brothers and sisters. Lord, as long as they're lifting up the name of Jesus, preaching your gospel, Lord, we bless them. They're our brothers and sisters. God, we bless the persecuted church as well, scattered abroad throughout the nations. Watch over them, protect them, bless them, deliver them, Lord God. May they endure to the end, to the glory of God. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement. We say, amen. Today, as you're having a seat, uh, Get in your Bible to the book of Psalms. We're taking a sidestep from the book of Colossians for five weeks while we head up to our birthday weekend celebration. Every year we do this, we talk about the subject of finances. Today we're going to be doing a part number two of giving matters. Now, don't worry if you missed last week. Today's message will stand on its own. Also, we'll refresh and review a couple of the principles that we learned about last week. While you're turning there to the book of Psalms, I'm reminded of a story of a circus that was traveling through different places, different towns, and as they were going through, they had their different acts. You know, the elephants, and they had the trapeze artists and all that kind of stuff. There was a strongman act, and the strongman loved to do this certain part of his act where he would take an orange, he would cut it in half, and he'd take that half of that orange, and he would squeeze it over a bowl. As he squeezed it, he would squeeze all the juice out of that bowl that he could get out of it. And he would just really press down on that thing, really, you know, just squeeze all of the the drops of juice out of it that he could get. Then he placed the bowl in the the center of the ring on a table, and he would taunt the crowd, and he would ask, if anybody thinks that they can squeeze another drop out of this orange, I dare you to come down here. And people all over the the nation would come, and they would try, and they would squeeze, and they would squeeze, and they would squeeze, and no one could get a drop of juice out of this orange. So one day he's in a certain city and he does this act. He squeezes all the orange juice out of this half slice of an orange into the bowl and he starts to taunt the crowd. But this time no one steps forward. It's completely silent. Everybody's just staring at him. And he's getting incensed. And he says, come on, somebody. Will you come on out and try and, try and squeeze it? Somebody take my challenge. And no one will. And finally he looks at the ringmaster like, what do I do? The ringmaster, come on, come on. you know. And so he says, I tell you what. I'll give you $1,000 if you'll come down here and squeeze squeeze one more drop of juice out of this orange. He looks back at the ringmaster, and the ringmaster kind of goes, okay, you know, they're not going to do it, so yeah, go ahead. And as he said $1,000, a hand shoots up in the crowd. (laughs) And he says, I see a hand up there in the crowd. You think that you can do it? And he heard a voice come back, for $1,000, I can. And so he says, come down here. I dare you to try. And this scrawny little man comes down. Very thin, very frail. He's got glasses that he's pushing up on his nose. He's got a pocket protector with pens in there. Very nerdy looking guy. And he comes down and the strong man's thinking, this is a joke. This is ridiculous. And this little man grabs the orange slice in front of this entire crowd and starts to squeeze. He starts to squeeze. He starts to squeeze. Sweat starts beating up on his forehead. He's pressing and he's pressing over that bowl. He's writhing in pain. He looks like it actually hurts him. The sweat starts pouring down his face. And after a while, wouldn't you know it, a golden drop of juice came out of that orange slice and dropped into the bowl. The crowd goes wild. Everybody goes unglued. It's nuts. It's pandemonium. And the man steps back and he gasps for air, and he's, he's just refreshed. And the strong man stops and says, I thought that was impossible. And the guy says, no, it's not impossible. I do that every day. He says, what do you mean you do that every day? He says, I do it for work every day. 
He says, where do you work? He says, I'm the church treasurer. I handle the finances at the church. I do that every day. Last week, we talked about giving matters. We talked about our money matters. How we give matters to God. What we give matters to God. Where we give matters to God. Last time we were together, we talked about the subject of why we give. Why we give. The giving starts with the heart. And that poverty and wealth are both conditions of the heart. You remember we said this, that if there's poverty inside of us, it will bring our surroundings down to the poverty level that's on the inside of us. But if we have wealth inside of us, the true wealth of the kingdom of God, it will bring our surroundings up to where we're at. Also, you remember we learned this, that true prosperity starts with giving. That we are in control of our prosperity. We are in control of what increase comes into our life. Because if you give, the Bible says that it shall be given to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over shall men pour into your bosom. With the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. True prosperity starts with our giving. I'm reminded of another story. 1983 edition of Leadership. They had an article about West Africa and the Sahel. A vast stretch of savanna more than 4,000 miles wide just under the Sahara Desert. In the Sahel, all the moisture comes in a four-month period, May, June, July, and August. After that, not a drop of rain falls for the next eight months. That means that the year's food supply, of course, must be grown in those four months when it's raining. Now, October and November are beautiful months. The granaries are full. The harvest has come. People sing and dance. They eat two meals a day. The meals lie heavy in their stomachs so they can sleep. December comes, and the granaries start to recede. Many families omit the morning meal. Certainly by January, not one family in 50 is still eating two meals a day. By February, the evening meal diminishes, and the meal shrinks even more during March. Children succumb to sickness. You don't stay well on half a meal a day. In April, you hear the babies crying in the twilight. Most of the days are passed with only an evening cup of gruel. Then, inevitably, it happens. A six- or seven-year-old boy comes running to his father one day with sudden excitement. Daddy! Daddy, we've got grain! He shouts. Son, you know we haven't had grain for weeks. Yes, we have, the boy insists. Out in the hut where we keep the goats, there's a leather sack hanging on the wall. I reached up and put my hand in there. Daddy, there's grain in there. Give it to mommy so she can make flour. And tonight our tummies can sleep. The father stands motionless. Son, we can't do that, he explains. That's next year's seed grain. It's the only thing between us and starvation. We're waiting for the rains, and then we must use it. The rains finally arrive in May, and when they do, the young boy watches as his father takes the sack from the wall and does the most unreasonable thing. With tears streaming down his face, instead of feeding his desperately weakened family, he goes to the field, and he takes the precious seed, and he throws it away on the ground. This seed is his own. He owns it. He can do anything he wants with it. But the act of sowing hurts so much that he cries as he scatters it in the dirt. Why? Because he believes in the harvest. And for all of us, we have to have the same attitude in our lives. We need to, when it comes to our giving, believe in the harvest. How we give matters, why we give matters, where we give matters, and what we give matters. Psalm 126, we're going to take a look at two verses, verse number five and verse number six. Look at what it says in verse number five. It says, though who sow in tears shall reap in joy. Verse number six, he who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. All of us want to reap. All of us want to have that joy. All of us want to be rejoicing. And yet, the Bible says that if you're going to reap with joy, that you must sow in tears. I understand the fact that when we give, it hurts. Right? Can anybody else say amen to that? Right? We're not so spiritual that we, oh, no, it doesn't hurt when I give. I'm so happy. Well, that's the attitude of the heart that we should have, of course. But it still hurts in the natural, doesn't it? Why? Because we have needs. There are things that come against us. There are lack. There's, 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 uh, you know, if you've got kids like I do, my kids are starting to grow. At that point, they're getting ready to be teenagers. Oh, my gosh. They're eating me out of house and home, and they haven't even hit 12 yet, some of them. Just crazy. They need shoes on their feet. There are things that take place. The car breaks down. All sorts of stuff happens in our lives, and we all could use more money. And yet the Bible says that even in the midst of lack, even in the midst where you could use that dollar in a thousand other places, 
that if you will sow in tears, that you will reap with joy, you bringing your sheaves in. Today, I want to talk to you about tithing because tithing matters. Tithing matters. Now, some of you guys have been in church all your life, and you already know where we're going with this today. You already understand the tithe. And when I say that, you're saying, yeah, amen to that. Because that's all you've ever known. That's all you've ever done. And you've seen the blessings of it in your life. Some of you in this room, though, you are going, what matter? What is a tithe? Right? I've had people that have written notes to the church. I'm sending you my tidings, T-I-D-I-N-G-S. And they send 10 bucks, 20 bucks, that sort of thing every now. Here's my good tidings to you, right? But that's not a tithe, when it comes to the things of God. That is good tidings. That's, hey, love you, and here's a little gift. That's great. That's wonderful. But that's not a tithe. Sometimes people think that, you know, their giving is a tithe, that, that get, tithing and giving are synonymous. They are not synonymous terms. What does tithing mean? Tithing means 10% or a tenth. So that means out of every dollar, 10 cents on the dollar is a tithe. Out of every $10, $1 is a tithe. And we find this principle all throughout the Bible. Now, again, let me clear up some, some uh, misunderstandings about the tithe. Sometimes people say, well, I tithe to my kids' Christian school where they're getting a Christian education. That's where my tithe goes. That's where 10% of my income goes, right? Because it's very expensive. But that's not a tithe. That's called tuition, all right? And you need to pay your bills. You do need to pay your tuition, okay? But that's not a tithe. And we'll see why that is here in the Word of God in a moment. Sometimes people say, well, my tithe goes to the televangelist. I support a TV evangelist that I get a lot out of. That's wonderful. That's not a tithe. That's an offering. Because the Bible says, bring all the tithe into the storehouse. The storehouse is the place where you're getting fed. If you get in the hospital, that televangelist is not coming to your hospital bed to pray for you. We are. If you're having trouble in your marriage and you want to sit down with somebody and talk, the televangelist is not going to do that. The principal at the Christian school is not going to do that. We are. This is the place where you're getting fed. This is the place where you're being shepherded. We are leading you, and therefore, this is your storehouse. And the Bible says, bring all the tithe into the storehouse. So it doesn't go to the Christian school. It doesn't go to the televangelist. That's an offering. That's tuition, right? Sometimes people say, well, I give my tithe to the homeless or to the poor or to good works, that sort of a thing. And while that's a good thing to do, that's a wonderful endeavor, that's called almsgiving. That is something that's, that's a benevolence giving. That's good. That is very precious in the sight of the Lord as well. I would encourage you to continue to do that, but that's not a tithe. That's almsgiving. That's good works, and that is something that is important for us to do. However, that's over and above the tithe. Okay, Tithing means 10%. Now, there's a principle in the Bible called the principle of first use. That means anytime you see a concept in the Bible like love— grace. Anytime you see, you know, the loving kindness of God or the faithfulness of God, first time you see it most of the time for the rest of the Bible, you will see it in that light. It, it, it kind of gives you the guidance for how that goes. So the first time we see the word tithe in the Bible is with Abraham. You guys know Abraham, right? Father Abraham had many sons and many sons had Father Abraham. I knew you guys could complete that one. Some of you guys have been in church all your life. But Abraham, right, he was called out by God from his country, he was the father of faith. The Bible says that we are now the children of Abraham by faith. Is that right? We are grafted into national Israel, and we become part of the, the true Israel now by faith. And now Abraham is the father of faith. And so we're his sons, his daughters. We're his children. That's why he had many sons and daughters. Because we're following his faith. Abraham had a nephew named Lot. Abraham and Lot, remember last time we were together, we talked about they had so much wealth that they couldn't even stay on the same plot of land together. So Lot goes down by a place called Sodom, Sodom and Gomorrah. You guys know those places, right? Bad places. He ended up down there, and in the middle of that, there was a conflict that happened with five kings. They took Lot, they took all of his possessions, and so he was captive. Abraham hears about it. He takes his 318 servants, born in his own house, and he goes and he routes these armies, wins a victory, takes Lot back, and with that takes a whole bunch of spoil of war right? Gold, riches, swords, armor, all that kind of stuff. Cattle and sheep and oxen, all that kind of thing, right? The wealth of that day, and he brings it with him. While he's bringing it with him, another king by the name of Melchizedek, who is the king of a place called Salem, right, comes out to meet Abraham. Now, Salem, you guys know as Jerusalem, right? So here's Melchizedek. Now, the book of Hebrews, fast forwarded in the New Testament, chapter number five and chapter number seven, tells us about this guy Melchizedek, and it unlocks what this is really talking about. So Melchizedek being translated king of righteousness, and also he's the king of Salem or the king of peace, comes out to meet Abraham, the father of faith. Abraham had just won a battle. He had just won a victory, and there was great increase that came into his life. And because of that increase in that wealth, 
Melchizedek brings out bread and wine, which we know as to be communion, right? And so here he is. They have this communion meal together, and Abraham takes aside a tenth of the spoil of war, and he gives it to this king. Now, when the Bible tells us that Abraham did that, it says, and he, speaking of Melchizedek, blessed him. Melchizedek blessed Abraham, and the book of Hebrews tells us truly the lesser, speaking of Abraham, is blessed by the greater, speaking of Melchizedek. So when Abraham tithed, after an increase came into his life, there was a blessing that came upon his life after that from the representative of God who was a king priest. He was the king of righteousness. He was the king of Salem. He was a picture of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. So when we see the principle of first Jews, that means that anytime there's increase, anytime there's a victory, I got a paycheck today, woo, right? Then we take a tenth of that. We bring it to Jesus, the king of righteousness, our representative, right? We bring it to him and we give it to him and then Jesus blesses us. That's the principle that you find in the Bible. All right? Now let's see if this lines up because the second time should give us two points that anybody who does geometry and math knows when you have two points, you can create a straight line, can't you? And that's how it's going to go forward in the future. So now here's Abraham. He has a son named Isaac. Isaac has a son named Jacob. Jacob, you guys know. Jacob was the usurper. He was the one who held on to his brother's foot. He was the one who bought his brother's birthright, right, with a bowl of soup. And then later on, he deceived his father and he stole the blessing off of his life. So Jacob now is running for his life. His brother Esau wants to kill him because he took his birthright. Now he's taking his blessing. And as soon as dad dies, I'm going to kill him. So Jacob's mom doesn't want her favored son to die. So she sends him away to her brother and as he's running for, for his life, he finds a spot, pulls up a rock for a pillow, lays down, and has his famous dream. Here's the ladder ascending into heaven. There's angels ascending and descending upon it. God is over the top of it. And here God is speaking purpose, speaking destiny. He's talking to Jacob. Jacob wakes up and he says, surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. How awesome this place is. This is none other than Bethel. This is the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. And there he makes a promise to God, and he says, God, if you'll bring me back to this place, back to where? Back to the house of God in peace. He says, I will bring you a tithe of everything that you bless me with. See, all throughout the Bible, you will find the tithe is associated with blessing and with increase. You will find that those two points all the way through the Bible moving forward, that the tithe is associated with blessing and with increase, that any time there is an increase that comes into our life, that we are to bring it to the house of God, Bethel, where we're fed from, to the representative of God in our hearts to Jesus, and that as we bring that tithe, that a blessing will come on our lives and that that blessing will carry us forward in our lives. Are you guys listening today? You guys got the principle down? Very important because we're laying the foundation. Now, God takes the children of Israel, okay? He continues them on. Like I said, we've got these two points, and now moving forward, we see that the children of Israel were eventually enslaved in Egypt. They were in deep poverty. They had nothing. They were slaves. And God brings them out with a great and mighty breakthrough, right? It was the Exodus. Miracles, signs, and wonders are happening, and he takes them into the wilderness where he fed them with angel bread, right? Angel food cake every morning. Can you imagine that? Some of you sugarholics are like, yes, Lord, and a cup of coffee, right? That'd be wonderful. And so they ate the food of angels, but it was never God's intent for them to live off of miraculous provision, God wanted to bring them into a land that was flowing with milk and honey. Now, where there's milk, there's cows. Where there's honey, there's bees, but there's also flowers. There's also fruit. There's also trees. There's also abundance. Hello. So if the land is flowing with milk and honey, that means that it's an abundant land. It's a prosperous land. God didn't want them to live in a land of not enough or just enough. He wanted them to live in a land of more than enough. And today it's no different. God wants to take you out of bondage and slavery to, to sin, to sickness, to poverty. But God will break you out with miraculous provision. But God doesn't want you to live off the miracle. God wants you to live off the blessing. God wants to take you from the land of not enough to the land of just. But God wants to bring you into the blessing of God to the blessing of more than enough. That's the will of God for your life. Notice the day that they came into the promised land and they ate of the fruit of the land, the manna stopped. 
It was never God's will for them to live off of man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Financially speaking, this bondage is poverty. Tithing is that breakthrough that will deliver you from the spirit of mammon and poverty and bring the blessing of God on your life. See, there is a spirit attached to money. Money itself is not evil. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, the Bible says. And when we love it, there's a spiritual thing that takes place. Our heartstrings are attached to it. Jesus said, no man can serve two masters. Either you will love the one and hate the other, or you will serve the one and despise the other. And then Jesus concludes by saying, you cannot serve both God and mammon. When you tithe, you break that spirit, that spirit of mammon that would try and hold you in bondage, that would try and hold you in slavery, that would try and keep you in poverty. And have you serving wealth? Have you serving finances? And it breaks that spirit off of that, and it now blesses it and brings you into the blessing of God. That's what this is all about. While the children of Israel were still wandering in the wilderness, there's a passage in the book of Leviticus. I want you to turn there with me, Leviticus chapter number 27. How many times have you been in church and heard a pastor say, turn with me to Leviticus? Just dwell on that while you're turning there. Leviticus chapter number 27, we find the principle of the tithe. And many times people get down on the tithe because it was in the law. But notice that it came 430 years before the law with Abraham, with his grandson Jacob. And then Jesus taught about it. He says, don't neglect the tithe. He says, I want you to focus on the weightier matters of the law, the heart, right? Mercy, justice, and judgment, right? But he says, don't neglect your tithe because it'll bring the blessing of God on your life. Here in Leviticus chapter number 27, Verse number 30, take a look at it with me. Right towards the end, it says this, in all the tithe of the land. Everybody say all the tithe. All the tithe tithe of the land. Sometimes people say, well, pastor, I give. I take a look at their giving and I calculate 10% and I say, are they living off of $10,000 a year? Because they only gave $1,000 last year. That's not a tithe. That's 1%. Pastor, I, I, I give my tithe and you calculate it out. That's not a tithe. He says, all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. Now, if you read on in the next couple of verses, it actually talks about that all of the cattle, all of the herds that pass under the rod, they would count them and they would create a narrow space and they would pass them underneath their shepherd's staff. And as they passed underneath that, they would count them. He says, every 10th one is the Lord's. See, they, even though they had coins and money and wealth during that time from the nation of Egypt, their wealth was really in what their, their increase was through their crops, through their land, and as well through the, the herds that they had. Here's the principle for all of us, though, is that one-tenth of whatever is brought into our lives an increase is the Lord's. Now, before you start thinking that God's being unfair and wanting to take your money, this is in the book of Leviticus, right? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Just made sure you didn't leave the room and I just was here all by myself. Okay. This is in the book of Leviticus before they ever entered the promised land. Are you guys tracking? Did they have fields to sow at this time? No. No. So God says, I'm bringing you into a land. I'm going to give you fields. I'm going to give you herds. I'm going to give you houses you didn't build, cities you never developed, vineyards and fields that you never sown. I'm going to hand that to you. All I ask for is 10% back. That's a pretty good deal, isn't it? She said, I'll take it. I would take it too. If God came to me and said, my son, I have 100 acres of land in central California. I'm going to give you 100 acres of fruitful, prosperous land. All I'm asking is that 10 of those acres you take and you give back to me. That's 90 acres more than I had before, right? That's a pretty good deal. And then God says, I'll bless you. Praise the Lord, right? That goes beyond the 90 acres. See, that's essentially what God is telling them. I'm giving you something. Everything that you're going to have, I'm giving to you. Will you just take 10% and give it back to me? Of course I will. That's a really good deal, God. That's actually pretty amazing. And yet we say, no, I got this job. God didn't fill out the paperwork. I did. 
I'm sorry, the air that you're breathing, did you create that too? The body that you're living in, did you, did you weave that together in your mother's womb or did God? See, everything that you have, everything that you ever will be, all of your net and gross well, everything that's associated with you was given to you by God. You are a steward, and God's only asking for 10% back. See, a dime on a dollar is not a bad deal. God wants the first of what he gives to all of us. He wants to be put first. You know, there's a story of a guy that was in an airport, and he was traveling. Many of you guys have heard this story before. He was in an airport, and as he's traveling, he gets hungry, and so he goes to a place, and all they had was a little donut stand. So he goes, and he buys himself a bag of donuts. He's looking for a place to sit down. It's really crowded, and finally he finds a seat, but it's at a table with another guy. He's sitting, eating his breakfast, too. And so he sits down. He's got his, his travel bag. He puts his travel bag and the bag of donuts down. He grabs his newspaper, and he starts to read his newspaper, and he gets hungry. So he puts the newspaper down, and he looks, and there's the bag of donuts. And so he reaches into the bag of donuts, and he starts to eat a donut. The guy across from him looks up and smiles. And he reaches into the bag and he grabs the donut. Now, the guy is incredulous. On the inside, he's thinking, what on earth is this guy doing? Taking one of my donuts. How could he? Just because I sat here, is there some unspoken agreement now that we're sharing my breakfast? And so the man takes the bag and he turns it towards himself, grabs a donut and pops it in. The man across the way smiles at him, turns the bag back around, grabs the donut, pops it in. Now the man's like, I'm going to show him. He takes the bag, pulls it towards himself, and puts his arm around it and gives him the evil eye. (laughs) Reaches in, grabs the donut, pops it in, and chews on it while staring the man down. So the man, still smiling, nods at him, reaches over his arm, grabs the bag, grabs the last donut, pops it in half, throws half of it back in, puts it back inside of the wall that he had created, pops the donut in, waves at him, and heads out. Now, the man is just beside himself. He's like, I can't believe that people have come to this. This is ridiculous. What on earth is going on? We have lost our minds Just then he realizes he's getting late for his flight, and so he reaches down to his briefcase and his bag, and he realizes his bag of donuts is on his suitcase still. See, the man wasn't stealing his donuts. He was sharing his donuts. See, God is not stealing your money. He's sharing with you. See, the blessing of God comes on the tithe, and the rest of it is now your finances to do with. And that blessing comes on your finances as well. Remember, the tithe is holy, but the blessing comes on your life. Let me show this principle to you in the book of Romans, chapter 11, verse number 16. Now, this in the context is talking about national Israel and how the Gentiles have been grafted in with Israel, and now we are a part of the blessing and part of the covenants, okay? That's the context, okay? But I want to apply this principle to what we're talking about today. Romans eleven sixteen 16 says, For if the first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. See, what comes out of a holy root can only be holy that's produced from it. Therefore, if you're setting aside a tithe, if the first fruit is holy, then the lump, the rest of it, is also holy. It's all God's. It's all blessed when you bring the tithe. And therefore, in our lives, we need the blessing of God more than we need the 10% of our finances. Are you listening today? See, God wants to partner up with us in our lives. Think about it like a franchise, right? You guys heard of McDonald's, a little company, right? Billions served, those juicy, wonderful hamburgers. And, and what happens when somebody becomes a McDonald's franchise? They get the name. What else do they get? They get the logo. What else do they get? They, they, they get free advertising, right? McDonald's, ba da ba 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 They've got their commercials on TV. And every time somebody sees that commercial and then drives by your franchise, they're thinking, ba da ba 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 I'm loving it, right? 
You get their training manuals, you get their logo, you get, you get the brand recognition, you get all that, right? You get their, their, their quarterly updates and their, their newsletters, and, and, and they'll come and visit you, quality control, all that kind of stuff. You get their suppliers, you get discounts, you get all sorts of stuff, right? And there's perks and benefits that come with being one of their franchises if you're one of the top producing stores. All they ask is for the franchise fee. Is that right? Now, if you don't pay that franchise fee then you no longer get the newsletter. You, you no longer get their, their blessing. In fact, they're going to come in and take over, right? And they're going to put someone in there who will pay the franchise fee and who will continue to be producing for them. Why? Because you didn't pay the franchise fee. So when we bring our tithe, we're getting in partnership with God. God is offering you a franchise for 10 cents on every dollar. That's a pretty good deal, isn't it? What do you get? You get the name. You get the blessing. You get the newsletter. Hello, come on somebody. You get all of it. You get his help. You get his training. You get his resources. You get his wealth. You get everything that comes with it. Let me show this to you in the Word of God. Many times when we talk about the tithe, we go to Malachi, the third chapter. Turn there with me to Malachi, right before the book of Matthew, right? Right before the New Testament and the Gospels, you'll find the book of Malachi, the last book in the Old Testament. The book of Malachi And the third chapter, God has something to say about this. Malachi chapter number three, and I want to take a look starting in verse number eight, and we're going to read through verse number 11. Malachi, the third chapter, verse number eight, look at what it says. Will a man rob God? We'd say, how can you rob God? He's in heaven, right? God is a spirit. He's invisible. How could you rob God? Look at what it goes on to say. Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. Now remember, this is after they entered the promised land. This is after they were given the cities and the homes and the vineyards and the fields and the wealth. That God had said, I'll give it to you, but the tithe, all the tithe is the Lord's. I'll get enfranchised with you. I'll give you the business. You just got to bring me 10%. You've robbed me, though. You haven't paid the franchise fee. Verse number nine, you are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Sometimes people say, well, wait a second. God's asking for 10% of my income, and then he's going to curse me? That's not fair. No, God didn't curse you. You cursed yourself. See, because we would say of somebody who had their franchise taken away for not paying their franchise fee, well, they deserved it. Why? Because they didn't pay their franchise fee. In the same way, God gives us everything we have, and then when God takes away his blessing, how many of you know that's a curse? But you did it to yourself by not being obedient to what God asked you to do. And now we're going to blame God? No. It's not God's fault. It's our fault for not listening and obeying. See, if you want a good relationship with the company, you pay the franchise fee. And if you want the blessing of God... You bring your tithe into the storehouse. Look at what it says in the next verse, verse number 10 and verse number 11, okay? Verse number 10, look at what it says. Bring all the tithes. Everybody say, all the tithes. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse. That's the place where you get fed, right? That there may be food in my house, in Bethel, in the house of God. Remember, we said this is what you're going to see all the way through the Bible. And try me now in this. This is the only place in the whole Bible you're going to find God saying, test me. Check it out. See if it works. Every other time, God said, don't test me. Don't you do it. You better live a holy life. Don't test me. You better walk uprightly and blameless before. Don't test me. But right here, God says, test me. Check it out. See if it works. But test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Now, I know the image that you are getting when we read these verses because I've had this image oftentimes throughout my life when I think about these verses. We think about, I bring a tithe, right? I, I'm sowing in tears. I bring it, and it hurts, and I give it to God, and there it goes into the bucket. And as I'm going home, I pull up in my driveway, and I walk out, and I hear, and I look up, and there's the windows of heaven. 
They're opening up and down comes dollar bills just floating down upon me. I start to skip. I start to hop. I start to dance. I run around and I gather up as much of it as I can while I'm running around my front yard. There's so much that I start to make dollar bill balls and throw them at my wife. And I start to get the kids and they're sledding down these mountains and mounds of dollar bills. I fall backwards and I do a dollar bill angel in the front yard because the windows of heaven have opened up on me. Is that the picture that you get? That's the picture that I, I may, maybe you're not like me. Maybe you said, no, Dan, that's wrong. You're so wrong. But that's not the picture that God gives us. Because God says, I'll pour out a blessing. He didn't say, I'll pour out money. I'll pour out a blessing. Do you know what we define the blessing as? Blessing is the capacity to succeed. God says, I will pour out the capacity to succeed. So much so that you can't contain it. I bet every tither in this room could say, I could use some more money. Every tither in the room, and I'm talking real tither, not that one, real 10%, right? Every tither in the room can say, yeah, I could use some more. I've been a tither ever since I was age 15 years old. When I gave my heart to the Lord and I got my first paycheck, my mama asked me, she said, what do you want to do with this? I said, set aside 10% for God. The rest I'll throw in the savings account. Why did I do that? Because I grew up in a Christian home. I figured that's just what Christians do, and that's how I've lived my life ever since. Guys, I could use more money. I'm not making snow angels, making it rain on my kids, none of that stuff. I'm not doing any of that, all right? I could use some more money. I've had bills. I've had needs. But guess what? I am so blessed that I can't continue. I'm bursting at the seams. When I look at my wife, when I look at my children, when I look at this church, when I look at where God has brought me, when I look at what God has done, when I look at the the favor on my life, when I look at how God opens supernatural doors that no man can close and closes doors that no man, I am so blessed. I just can't contain it. And I bet every tither in this room could say the same about their lives. Look at what it goes on in verse number 11 to say, verse number 11, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground. Now remember, we started talking about the tithe of the ground. The devourer at that time was locusts and grasshoppers that would eat up their crops so that even though they wouldn't give God 10%, they wanted that extra 10%, they were left with 50%, 40%, or nothing. So he says, I will rebuke the devourer for your sake so that He will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field. See, the blessing is the capacity to succeed. On our own, there are going to be things that come and devour our finances. On our own, if you're hoping that that extra 10% is going to pay the bill, something else is going to happen. The car is going to break down. Kids are going to need shoes. Something's going to happen in the house. There's going to be something that that happens in, in, in your realm, in your sphere, That's unexpected. And yet if you want the blessing, the capacity to succeed, and the rebuke of God on the devourer of your finances, give God what's his. Bring all the tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house, says the Lord, and I will open up for you the capacity to succeed. Are you listening today? Proverbs chapter 3, verse number 9 and 10 says, Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. So, your barns will be filled with plenty. There's the fruit of your ground. And your vats will overflow with new wine. There's the vine bearing fruit. Why does that happen? Because you put God first. My wife and I, when we were in Bible college, we were doing pretty good. Doing okay. We were tithing. And uh, every month after expenses and things, we had about 20 bucks left over at the end of our bills. 20 bucks to us, that was pretty good because that meant we could go and eat at Taco Bell and we could go to the 50 cent movie theater, right? That was a good date for these two Bible college students at that time. And we were challenged in a class to do a budget. And as we did that budget, they wanted us to write down income at the top and all of our expenses underneath. And so we did that. And we looked at it and we didn't have $20 left over. We were in the negative. And we said, that's not right. We tore it up. We threw it away. We started over again. We had our income at the top, all of our expenses. We had the tithe on there down at the bottom. And then we looked at it, and it was in the negative. And we said, something's not right. And so we prayed about it. 
because it really bugged us. We're kind of those type A OCD people that, that that's just not right. We're not having that right. And so something's wrong and it was bugging us. So we prayed about it and God said, where's the tithe? We said, it's on there. It's right there, God. He says, but where is it on there? He says, right there at the bottom. He says, exactly. Put me first. See what happens. Wow, okay. So we ripped up that. We started over. We got our income, the increase that came into our life, the tithe right away. Then all of our bills. And then we put it and we subtracted everything. And this time we were worse than the negative. I said, God, what's that all about? But guess what? After we started writing that check first, we didn't have $20 left over. We had $200 left over. Taco Bell, bye-bye. 50-cent movie, nah, we're going to a matinee, $4. (laughs) Why? Because we put God first. And we haven't stopped putting God first ever since. And the blessing of God has come on our life. Here's what it comes down to for all of us. Why does God do this? He wants us to create a consistent pattern of giving. When God says, test me, this is not a slot machine that you put in a quarter today, pull the lever, and down come the blessings. I want you to notice we've been talking about land. We've been talking about sowing seed. Did you know that it takes a full year for a crop to come around if you're looking at wheat? And if you're looking at grapes, there is pruning. There is things that have to take place every year. There's cultivation of the soil. You've got to make sure that the right environment is there so that every year you can produce a harvest of grapes. Don't think that the seed that you sow today that you're going to be eaten off of tomorrow. The only thing that grows that fast is weeds. Unless you like mushrooms, then you can go sow some poop or something. I don't know, you know? But here's the deal. If you want a crop, if you want a harvest, create a consistent pattern of giving. Well, I tried it for a week and it didn't work. No, you're dumb. Because you sowed seed and then you walked away from it. You never did anything with it. God says, I want you to create a consistent pattern of sowing. See, the seed that you eat is last year's seed. That's last year's crop. What you do today will impact your future. The, the, the blessing that you're going to receive in the future, in the natural, in the financial realm, the things that you're going to feed off of in the future are things that you sowed years ago. We need to create a consistent pattern of giving. Let me remind you where we started today in Psalm 126, verse 5 and 6, those who sow in tears. See, time is hard. When you're looking at a future, when you're looking at a year to get a return, it's hard to give. Those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. There's going to come a day where you look out and it's white for harvest, where you look at the vines and the grapes are dangling down. Verse number 6, he who continually goes forth weeping. See, this is something that you don't do once and then God blesses you for the rest of your life. No, you're sowing and reaping and sowing and reaping and sowing and reaping. He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. We have to create a consistent pattern of giving in our lives. And that's why the tithe is so important because it does it for us automatically. Anytime there's increase brought into your life, you set aside that 10%, bring it to the house of God, and then the blessing of God, the capacity to succeed comes on your life. Let's pray together today. And I want you guys to pray for a moment and just ask this question to God. Say, God, what are you speaking to me? No one get up, no one leave during this time. Let's just take a moment in the presence of God so bow your heads and close your eyes. And I want you to ask yourself this question. What is God speaking to me? And take a moment and just listen. What's God speaking to you? Some of you, God said one word, tithe. Some of you maybe heard this, start. Maybe you heard what one lady shared with me she heard yesterday, offering. You've been bringing the tithe, but now it's time to bring an offering. What's God speaking to you? Would you just take a moment? 
Maybe God spoke a paragraph to you. Maybe he spoke a sentence to you. Maybe he spoke a word to you. Would you just take a moment? Whatever God spoke to you, would you just commit it to memory by writing a note? Would you just write that down on a piece of paper or maybe write it in the leaf of your Bible, put the date on it, what God spoke to you, what it's about? Maybe if you don't have a pen and paper, maybe you got your phone and you want to create a note and just God spoke this to me today. Just commit it somewhere because now you're accountable to it. You can remember it. You could go back if you forget. No, God spoke that to me on this day. So you God may have spoken to you about prosperity, that he's taken you from the land of just enough to the land of more than enough. Write that down. Write that down. If you're here with your husband or your wife, your spouse, if you're here with a, a good friend that you trust that's faith-filled for accountability, would you just share with them what God spoke to you right now? Just lean over, whisper in their ear, God just spoke this to me. I think God's telling me this. Would you just share that with, with your spouse or maybe you're here with a friend who will hold you accountable? Just share it with them right now. Just whisper it in their ear what God spoke to you right now. Just, just tell them. Brings accountability. Father, we thank you for your word today. God, we receive it with meekness. In Jesus' name, amen. Did you guys get something from the word of the Lord today? Come on, give God a great big praise. Hallelujah. Hey, quick.